Um, I, I was struggling a little bit uh, this morning to think of what to say to you because um, I used up my stock of political jokes at the Chamber of Commerce dinner and I used up most of my political messages at the party dinner last night so I was struggling, you know, what, what, what am I going to talk about? Uh, and I thought I would basically use my time here to try to explain how I and our parliamentary colleagues are dealing with the three big topical issues of the day, one of which is this big scandal that's now engulfing a parliament, uh, secondly Brexit, and the third which is coming in a couple of weeks time which is the budget, which is an important defining moment and actually is an area that interests me, economics. So I'll talk a little bit about those three. But before doing that, I, I, I think it's quite useful to reflect a bit on the extraordinary um, way in which you know, politics has been turned on its head uh, uh, in a very rapid way. I, I, I reflected that I was up here um, two years ago uh, in the autumn of 2015. Uh, I'd lost my seat in that awful election. Um, I settled into a new lifestyle. I was writing books, uh, talking to economic students, and I'd come up here for the Hexham Book Fair, which was launching uh, a book I'd just written, uh, the sequel to my book on the, on the financial crisis. And when I look back on that time, this was a period when um, Jeremy Corbyn, I think, had just been chosen as leader of the Labour Party, widely regarded as a joke and a mistake and wouldn't last very long. I don't think at that point anybody had heard of Mr. Trump or cared or thought he was remotely likely to be anything. Um, I had just written what I thought was actually quite a good book about the British economy and its future, uh, which didn't actually mention the word Brexit. And I just passed through Newcastle and they were deploring the way in which the football club was in the nether regions of the championship. And now we're looking at a future where uh, Newcastle United are probably going to be in Europe and Britain's going to be out of it. <laughs> but, um, but also uh, where you know, individual futures have changed, in, in my case, very radically. I mean, one of the things I haven't told many people about, which was that in the aftermath of the 2015 election, uh, it was suggested to me that I should perhaps join uh, Alan Beath and John Shipley and others in the upper chamber. And I thought briefly about it, and thought it was quite a flattering idea. And then, I, I, and lurking at the back of my memory was the fact that a few years earlier, there'd been a vote in Parliament on House of Lords reform and I think the party's approach was, a, you know, as good Lib Dems, was a fairly grad gradualist, reformist thing. But I remembered that on that <coughs> afternoon, I'd had a rush of blood to the head, and I'd followed uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Dennis Skinner, and John McDonnell into the revolutionary lobby to abolish the whole thing. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and this, this would not look good if I then accepted uh, <laughs> the ermine. So I finished up remaining as a commoner and uh, I'm here, right? This is the peculiar way that politics works. But it, I think it's a reminder in a sense of the way that politics doesn't go in straight lines. Uh, it's cyclical, subject to very rapid, unpredictable changes and we have to be ready for that. And in a way I, I'm personally very conscious of it because it isn't just the weird events of the last two years, but um, I was first chosen to stand in our party's interest back in the early 1980s when I was part of the SDP uh, breakaway, and I stood in my hometown of York. And when I was adopted, which was round about the Christmas of the year of the election, I think we're about 50% in the opinion polls. Um, that's sort of 82, not 83. And then a few months later, there was the Falklands War, and we just fell through the floor. I finished up being a respectable third, but had the world evolved in a different way, I'd have been MP for York, 
shortly after Alan came in as the MP for Berwick. But history worked in a different way. And after I'd stood twice, uh, the party disintegrated, got into a terrible state of low morale, but they fought their way back, they're now running the city. And the politics works like that. And, and I think for those of you who've been through quite torrid times, uh, it's worth remembering that it is possible to fight back, that history goes in cycles, that political moods change, and that what we have to offer actually has enduring value. And I would, a few minutes ago, I was just introduced to two of the really very distinguished members of the party who, you know, raised it up in, in the 70s, and stood as candidate in one case and helped Alan get elected in, in the 70s, and they're still here and still with us. But at the same time, one of the things that I've realized when I've been here is the potential of the next generation. Uh, talking to the guys in Sunderland, uh, Niall and, and Stephen and their team all in their 20s who are winning seats, reinventing the old style of community politics in a new way. And to my mind, the, the, the highlight of my visit, and I talked briefly about it last night, was visiting the university, and, um, which some Lib Dems tend to regard as a no-go area. Uh, but actually, I was promised 20 students, and 200 turned up. I'm very positive, very keen. I met them last night after the dinner and they're getting large numbers of recruits who want to come and help in, in the local elections. So, you know, we have the memories, we have the good times of the past, but we've also got big potential for the future and a lot of people who believe in us. And I think we've got to keep that very much at the front of our mind. But let me just say a little bit about the three big issues that dominate the event. We've got this um, dreadful sex scandal, which is reverberating, and I suspect that every day, probably for the next two weeks, some individual is going to be dragged out and their past um, exposed, and in some cases, whips withdrawn, whatever. So far, uh, we haven't been directly affected, in, at least in the House of Commons, but. As you know, there is a history. We have had ex-MPs who have done things they shouldn't have done. This, we're all going to be reminded of this. Um, members of the House of Lords, one has been mentioned, another is hinted at. So you know, there's no hiding place for any of us. None of, none of us are wholly open now. This is a, a pervasive problem. And I think there are two elements to it. I think one is a kind of systematic boys club approach which has operated in Westminster for many years, standards of behaviour that um, some people thought were acceptable even if they weren't 10, 20 years ago uh, and which have been continued unchecked and which are now being exposed and are clearly ugly and unacceptable. But under, underneath it, something which is worse which is the abuse of power uh, and the fact that MPs like some business people, like barristers, are effectively self-employed and they have people who are dependent on them. They're not, we don't have the standard processes of big companies or civil service and abuses have been allowed to flourish uh, without, being, without any checks on it. So the question now is, what we do about it. And, I, and I'm, I'm deliberately raising this here because at the moment this is posed as an issue for members of parliament, which of course it is. But it's also for the party as a whole because you know these issues arise in local government, they arise in local associations, and as a, as a party we have a duty of care to people who come within our organisation. Uh, it's great that we have the largest ever membership, we now have over 100,000, bigger than the Tories, we think. But we have a duty of care to the people who join, and we have to deal with this properly. And uh, I'm, I'm going to a meeting on Monday with the Prime Minister, Corbyn, uh, and to agree an approach which we have to adopt. And what I want to be able to tell them is that although the Lib Dems are no better or worse than anybody else, we're not going to try to be superior, uh, we have learned lessons 
and we have got systems in place that um, are, I wouldn't say better, but more advanced than, than elsewhere in the political system. And we did introduce, after the um, scandal we had four years ago, um, an arrangement at present, I don't know how many of you were aware of it, but within the party there is a pastoral care officer based at headquarters, and if people are bullied, subject to harassment, talking overwhelmingly about women here, uh, they have somebody to go to outside of line management who can investigate, uh, take the side of the person who is being harassed. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is a system that has been quite widely used, I mean, not in Parliament, but in ordinary party associations, and has worked well. Uh, and we have to ensure that throughout mainstream politics, this is the kind of arrangement that parties have and which we have in part. But, you know, as I say, this, this is a scandal that could well grow and grow and grow. And it is in danger of uh, completely undermining confidence in democratic politics. We almost... Um, Sub, sub, uh, was submerged by this in the expenses scandal uh, just over a decade ago, it's now happening again. And it's incumbent on us as a party to make sure that we get this absolutely right. Uh, and I think we're in a reasonably good place, but any feedback from you or any thoughts from you would be appreciated. But I think there's another angle to this, which is political. Um, we may find that in the next few weeks uh, there are going to be a spate of by-elections. I don't know. I don't know what will happen. Uh, Sheffield Hallam are now on kind of battle alert. Uh, there are others which may be coming through the system. We may have to be prepared to fight elections uh, which we didn't anticipate and we don't have a vast stockpile of money. Uh, but I hope that when when or if the situation arises, we will go into battle because actually this is an opportunity to put ourselves back on the political map. Maybe, maybe. And the other big political implication is that at a time when the country is in desperate need of good political leadership, the Prime Minister, the government are weaker than they have ever been. I mean, Theresa May is just surviving. It can't be said to be doing anything more. Uh, she's got, she's now obviously completely dependent on this man with the tarantula, who uh, <laughs> is uh, the Defence Secretary. I mean, it is, it is almost beyond fiction. I mean, the idea that somebody gets a top job in the government because they've got a little black book with a lot of compromising names in it is, is not terribly reassuring from a democratic point of view, but it shows how weak the government is. And, you know, at a time when democracy is struggling to establish its legitimacy and at a time when we're embarking on the most important negotiations that the country's had in a generation or more, so that's all I have to say about that subject, but it does segue uh, immediately into the issue of Brexit, which is important for us as a country and is especially important for us as a party because this is one of our defining issues. And the Liberals and the SDP separately and the Lib Dems as a whole have always been the party of Europe. It was something that we committed ourselves to partly because of the practical economics of the common market and then the European Union, but actually because it represented something bigger and better. This was countries rising above old-fashioned nationalism, doing things cooperatively. It wasn't world government, but it was a step towards a better world where you know, environmental values, human rights, uh, were entrenched in law and cooperation between <coughs> governments and for this all now to be put at risk is something that hits at the heart of everything we believe in and I think so far we have maintained our position and reputation as a party that fought consistently to remain is now warning of the dangers that will come from Brexit 
uh, and which is offering a democratic opportunity mm. for exit from Brexit. What has happened, I think, over the last few weeks uh, is doing everything to reinforce our judgments on this matter. The negotiations are going badly because the government was ill-prepared and disunited. They had never realized that disengaging from all the complex um, regulatory <coughs> arrangements that had grown up over 30 years in the single market would have to be disentangled, they just didn't realize it. They're now hopelessly unprepared. Hundreds of civil servants have been signed up on a daily basis to try and get to grips with this. They announced a couple of days ago that 300 lawyers have been hired by government. I mean, this is just mind-boggling. And they're spending 600 million pounds within the next few months in order to prepare for the possibility that the negotiations might fail. I mean, you know, you could do with 600 million quid here, you know, do a lot of good things, but this is entirely, potentially wasted um, money, uh, and all as a result of negotiations that are not being properly prosecuted. Uh, we're faced with the very strong possibility now, it was considered a remote scenario, but it's now looking very real, uh, that the negotiations may just collapse in a heap because it isn't possible to reach agreement. The central problem being the cash contribution. What the Europeans have said, not unreasonably, is that you, the British, want the divorce, we don't. Uh, so you're going to have to be reasonable. Um, you know, divorce happens in the real world. Somebody has to make a decision on who gets the car and the house and all that kind of thing. And the Europeans have said, okay, you pay your contributions, the stuff that projects the British committed to, the pensions of civil servants, the rest of it. You can argue about whether this is 40 billion or 50 or 60. You've got to pay, and sign the check, and then we'll start talking about a trade relationship. So that's not unreasonable. The British government is now partly because of the extreme weakness of the Prime Minister, totally incapable of making that offer. Because if she offers what is seen by the hardliners to be too much, her position will finally collapse. So she can't make the offer, so the negotiations can't progress. And in the background, we've got uh, the Democratic Unionists um, refusing to compromise on the Irish border question, the beginnings of a suggestion that even Sinn Féin may return to the armed struggle if the negotiations break down. So they can't get beyond first base into the position where we have serious trade negotiations. And that's where the potential for a collapse is, is all too real. Now, in these circumstances, it does seem to me, quite apart from our party partisan interests, it is in the national interest that we are able to offer a way out. At the present, there is legislation starting to go through Parliament, which is supposed to embed the exit process. Um, we've been discussing, kind of informally, with a lot of Labour rebels and some Tories, and I perhaps say Tories are not very courageous, but there are a few of them who are willing to talk about it, uh, to try to uh, stop the worst abuses within the Brexit legislation, the so-called Henry VIII powers, which devalue Parliament rather than enhance it. But we want to incorporate within it provisions whereby there is a, a vote of the public to have the final say on whether the deal, bad, indifferent or non, is supported by the public. Now at the moment, there's ourselves, a few Labour people, the Scottish Nationalists, a few others, uh, but at some point within the next few months, we're going to have to make a bid to try to get a parliamentary majority in the Lords, the Commons, both, to have such a vote. And I think this is terribly important that we get the arguments right. Because when you mention referendum and Lib Dems, everybody groans and say, no, we do not want to rerun the referendum. 
we do not want a second referendum, even a lot of Remainers recoil from this idea. And I think it's important we get the arguments right. We're not talking about rerunning the last referendum. It's been, it's done. What we're talking about is a vote on the facts once we know what they are. To say to the public, actually, you voted for Brexit. We weren't quite sure what it meant. But now we know what it means. Do you really want this? Or do you want an exit from Brexit? And I think that is a sensible, legitimate question which most people will probably be rather relieved to be asked. I'd have to say, I've always made this clear, I'm not a fan of referendums. I don't think we should ever have got ourselves in the position of deciding this issue in this way. But having launched the process in that way, I think the only way of bringing this to a satisfactory conclusion is through another vote. And we've got to be prepared for the fact that it may well now happen. And if it does happen, we've got to win it this time round. The last campaign was a disaster. It's got to be done properly. And we've got to accept there is a risk, of course. The public might well say, well, to hell with it. Let's charge out and live with it. In which case, we would have to accept that. But I think this is a national imperative now that we have this process. And it does present a major opportunity to us as a party because we've been consistently right about this question. Right, thirdly and finally, to say something about the budget. Um, it, it's rather more important than it usually is, in fact, because what's been happening in recent years is you get two budgets a year. Well, Canada stopped that. We're going to have a budget in three weeks' time, and it will be the last for a year. It's also very dangerous because the uh, position of the government in relation to the budget is deteriorating quite rapidly. It's deteriorating in part because of Brexit, because the economy is slowing down, businesses are not investing, uh, consumer spending that was driving the economy is also beginning to dry up. So the economy slows down, the government gets less revenue, the, the budget position deteriorates. We can see that happening at the present time. At the same time, he and the government are under enormous pressure to spend more money. Now, the, the welfare system is under enormous stress, enormous hardships have been created with the way in which the universal credit system has been introduced, disability benefits, you know this from those of you who do casework. Uh, the school system is under enormous pressure, the NHS is bursting at the seams, people are, you know, even Tories are now yelling at the government to spend more money. At the same time, there isn't any appetite for higher taxation. So they're in a real bind. So what do we do and say as a party? I think there is an enormous um, scope for a sensible party that says, on the one hand, we do need a fairer society, we do need better public services, and we've got to pay for them. But at the same time, we don't believe in fairies and magic money trees and vast amounts of money being spent with no revenue being raised in the Corbynite style. Which is, in other words, which is a believer in public services and fairness, but also believes in sound money. And those of you who've been in local government have had to operate in that harsh real world. So I think there are various things I will want to argue within that framework. I think the first is there is a considerable scope for relaxing what's sometimes called austerity in, a, in an economically sensible way. You've got to distinguish between what uh, the anoraks call current spending and investment. These are not the same. And what the government could be doing is borrowing to finance investment in sensible um, public activities like social housing and in transport. And this is different from spending on the civil service. You know, these things generate an income, they generate an asset. You can actually drive down government debt if you invest sensibly. And what I will be arguing is we should be freeing up network rail to get on with railways investment. Very important, you know, metro on time side is an obvious thing to do. It's an economically sensible thing to do. It's not wasting money. 
uh, and at the same time a lot of investment in public sector housing. The housing crisis is absolutely appalling. Here it's more around the lack of social housing in the south of England, it's more about affordability and private ownership. But either way, a vast amount of housing has to be built. The government's got to drive it because developers are not doing it. Uh, and this is something that can be done. Even the community secretary is now going around publicly saying the government's got to borrow large amounts of money. So far been stamped on by the Treasury, but we, we should support that. So the first thing I will be pushing for is a lot more public investment. I think the second is we do need to stand up for public services, not to argue they've got to be honestly financed. Uh, I found it immensely frustrating that in the general election campaign, very few people seem to get the very simple idea that we were trying to put across that we, the, the NHS needs more money and that you need a bit more tax revenue to pay for it. I thought the penny and the pound of income tax for the health service was one of our best policies, but for whatever reason, it didn't get through. But we need to keep repeating it. And the reason for repeating it is not just that the NHS does need more money, of course it does, but because it cements the idea that Lib Dems are serious, sensible people who realize you can't just invent money, you've got to raise it, you've got to confront the public, with the question, if you want to get public services, you've got to pay for it. And a, a fair and sensible way of doing it is through the basic rate of income tax. A third idea which I'm trying to develop, and I talked about this over dinner last night, is trying to provide a good deal for young people. Uh, it's very tempting, particularly in view of our history around student tuition fees, to say, to join the current uh, clamour for just writing off student debt, which even Jeremy Corbyn's admitted is not financially possible because once you start scrapping fees uh, or even cutting them, basically all you're doing is taking money away from universities. It's not a very sensible idea, however politically attractive it is. So you need another way of doing it. And my suggestion has been we create a fund, an endowment, a learning account, whatever phrase, catches on with the public, maybe 15,000, something of that order, which everybody who's 18 gets to spend over their lifetime on continuing education, postgraduate courses, reskilling, whatever. And it's financed by the wealthier members of the older generation who have done extraordinarily well out of pension funds and rising property values. Um, through some form of wealth taxation in order to fund that. And that will be quite a difficult sell, but that is, it seems to me, incorporates the basic principle of fairness that we should be about. So those are the basic ideas uh, I want to run within the budget. Uh, there's a danger, of course, is we just get lost in the noise, but I think those are you know, good defensible principles and policy that we should be starting to talk about. But thank you for listening to me, particularly as some of you helped me for 20 minutes, half an hour yesterday night. Um, I'm here for questions and answers, I think, as well as just talking to you. But anyway, but thank you for inviting me and having a really productive visit. I really appreciate it.